Now I'm going to apologise to start up because this is the first time I've done this talk. I've completely rewritten it to actually just emphasise the sorts of things that my PhD students are doing and a few of my postdocs. So in that sense, I hope it doesn't come across as this mishmash of separate stories. But I wanted to give you a sense of what it's like to be a PhD student and working on particular projects without trying to drill down into huge amounts of detail. So if at any point there's too much detail, shout and say, we've had enough of that, let's move on. Okay? So why, well let's move on to the first slide. And hopefully this is about as complicated as I want to make it. It's essentially the life cycle of rhizobium. Now I'm sorry, the plants in this case are represented as little uh, cells and this is a nodule down here. But really what I wanted to try and emphasise is what we're trying to do as a lab is understand how a bacterium goes from being a free living organism in the soil, how it actually sticks onto roots, and, and the first part is an attraction and communication. The bacterium has to realise the plant's there, the plant has to send out signals for the microbe. So there's attraction, communication, and then there's a really important step of adhesion. They've got to get their act together. So the bacteria effectively, and I won't go into too much detail, but we think there are two basic pathways. There's where bacteria actually stick onto the root surface, and there's also when bacteria stick onto the end of root hairs. So here just represented as a little stick. Now you probably already know a little bit about this, either from school or from first year lectures, that this is rhizobium and it can actually grow down this root hair in a thing called an infection thread. It's just a little tube the plant makes and the bacteria grow down it. And they grow down this infection thread and actually the plant ramifies this infection thread down into the cortex, so the cells underneath the surface. And what happens at the same time is the plant starts making this nodule structure which if you've, hopefully you've pulled up some legumes and you've seen the little nodules on the roots, they can be about two or three millimetres in size. And actually, we're showing this here as this nice little bump now outside, red in the middle because the plant makes leg hemoglobin to control the oxygen. But this is now full of bacteria and what they're doing is they're fixing nitrogen. They're taking N2 out of the air and they're turning it into ammonia and giving it to the plant. And it's, it's the ultimate symbiosis in many ways because the plant is giving the bacteria photosynthate, because that's what plants do, don't they? They photosynthesize, they take CO2, they make sucrose, they transport it down from the shoot to this nodule, and they give the bacteria a lunch, give it car a carbon source, a meal, and in return the bacteria give the plant ammonia, which the plant turns into amino acids, and we all know we need amino acids for proteins. But eventually this is going to lead to release, the nodule breaks down and the bacteria are released. And actually, in terms of the evolution of this process, that's crucial. This, this starts from a single bacterium, sticks onto root hair. So most nodules are clonal. It's incredibly important in terms of the evolution and selection because a single bacterium has to compete to get into a nodule. That means this is the ultimate sort of competition. So all the things that are important about being able to get into a plant are crucial here. We have a single cell normally leading to a clonal population of about 10 to the 9 bacteria which get released into the soil. So there's a huge advantage for a bacterium to get into a nodule and to fix nitrogen and then to be released because it's gone from one cell to 10 to the 9. But there's all sorts, if you think about it, selection processes going on and there are also cheats. There are bacteria out there that are cheating in the process they're actually not giving nitrogen back to the plant, they're trying to get carbon and so on. So there's all sorts of processes going on. Okay, I'm now going to talk about just the first step, attraction and communication. And I'm really talking about what's being done by a PhD student in my lab, Sam Arany, with some help from James Wheeler in um, uh, zoology. I probably have to come up here just to show you what would happen. So this is, so what Sam is doing is actually this is bacteria swimming around and clearly you've got to be able to swim to the root to be able to actually enter it, stick to the root and get in. And so this is doing a lot of imaging of this and this is just showing remarkable things here. If you look here, there's a single cell and it's, it's actually, it's doing a hundred and, well it's actually coming in here and then it's reversing and coming around again. So I'll play that again so you can see that. So they do these complete turns 
Yeah, you can see that cell going there. So the bacteria actually do these remarkable runs. They come in at this and then they'll reverse direction. So clearly the bacteria have to be able to modify their swimming when they see gradients to get onto the plant root. So a lot of what Sam is doing is trying to understand the genetics of how the bacteria swim to roots, how plants actually attract them in the first place. So what else can you do with that? This is a really nice image here. This is to say, well, how do we actually measure now how bacteria get attracted to roots? And this is a, a, a collaboration between Sam and Jack Parsons. And what they're doing in real time, they're imaging using confocal microscopy, GFP labeled bacteria. It's so 10 hours now at zero, one. Look how the bacteria are accumulating around the root, particularly around the, the root elongation and, and early development zone down here. And so this technique is something where it's, it's based on microfluidics. It allows us to look at how bacteria are attracted to roots, what happens when you look at mutants of the bacteria or plant mutants, what is the type of communication between the bacteria and the plant. And this is just a system that allows us to actually be able to study how they can actually move towards uh, the root system. But one of the things that's really interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this technique later on, is it's pretty obvious, isn't it? You think, okay, you're going to need chemotaxis and motility. So chemotaxis is recognizing a gradient for the bacteria to swim to the plant root. So, and actually, we actually have this genetic technique to measure this. And this is this process called attachment where the bacteria stick onto the root. Now, when we looked at this process, it's neutral. It doesn't, you can knock out any of these chemotaxis motility genes and you have no effect on the ability to swim to and attach to the root. Now that was quite bizarre because that's the obvious reason this would be important. And actually it turns out it's essential for the bacteria to get into that infection thread and it's essential for them to make bacteroids, but it's not important in that first step. So why might that be? And so one of the things that Sam and Jack are doing is trying to understand at which stage the bacteria are blocked by not being able to recognise chemical gradients from the plant. And again, that means doing things, this is a root hair, and these little green blobs which are end on are the bacteria attached onto root hairs. They actually attach end on. There's a specific molecule at the at one pole of the bacterium which recognises a plant lectin and they stick on, end on. And we're trying to ask, well, is at this stage the bacteria have to recognise a chemical gradient coming from the root hair? We don't know what that is. Actually, I think this is likely to be a key step. The bacteria have to lock into that, that attachment and that's going to be investigated by Sam, again, by looking at... Uh, uh, fluorescently labelled with GFP and M cherry and comparing the wild type of mutants and mixtures to ask is that the stage at which chemotaxis becomes crucial? Is there a new signal coming from the plant root, root hair which needs to be recognised? Or could it be something, this is, an infection, this is a little infection pocket down here, as the bacteria stick onto the end the root hair curls over and traps them. Is there a stage in here where the bacteria, again, need to be attracted to the root. And so these are the sorts of questions that are being asked to understand that developmental process. So making mutants of the bacteria, labelling them, using confocal microscopy to try and understand which stage is affected. And I think that's a key element of a lot of plant microbe interactions which hasn't been investigated properly yet. The temporal and spatial basis of these steps when is a particular process crucial? And that's absolutely, it's been difficult to investigate, but these techniques are becoming available now and I think will play a big role for people like yourselves uh, if you move into these sorts of areas. This is an infection thread. See this line here? This is a root hair. These are our bacteria growing down the infection thread. So again, we would investigate if that step is being affected in these chemotaxis mutants. So that's really just showing here this stage of growing down the infection thread. So again, is that where chemotaxis is important? So I'd like to zoom out a little bit and talk, how, how do we look at overall the processes and stages? So this is, 
Vinoy Ramachandran, who's actually one of the tutors today, and he did this work as a PhD student. This is getting a little bit old now. Um, well, we're all getting a little bit old, but this is, this is microarray work, so it introduces the topic of what happens to genes in the bacteria. What genes do you need to be able to colonise different plants and ultimately then at different stages? So we actually took our Rhizobium leguminous R and Biovar viscae, which infects peas, nodulates peas, and you get nitrogen fixation of peas. And we, one of the nice things is we know the host plant for this is a pea. And that's really unusual to know that a bacterium has a particular host plant. And so we put it into the rhizosphere of pea and then into a non-host legume and then onto sugar beet, which is an outlier plant. So what we wanted to ask was just what genes do you need? What genes are expressed when you put them on your host plant, onto a non-host legume and onto an outlier plant? So it's one of those types of experiments where by designing the right types of uh, the right types of plants to use, you can ask really important questions. What genes do you need as a bacterium to infect any, or to, to exist in the rhizosphere of any plant, just in, around the roots of any plant? What do you need to specifically associate with your host? Um, and so that was the purpose of that. And these next slides, two slides, almost want you to close your eyes because it's just a really complicated diagram showing, look, there's things in black which you express when you're on any plant. There are things in green which you actually express when you're specifically uh, associating with a P. The only thing that's important, these are transport systems, and you'll notice there's substrates with them. And this was simply enabled us to say, this gene here, RL0996, gets switched on in the P rhizosphere, and we know it's a transport system for tartrate. So the obvious thing is that means there's tartrate in the P rhizosphere. Okay? So it allowed us to map metabolites. And there's a metabol metabolism diagram, but what did we do with that? That's the key thing. A lot of information, what do we do with it? We wanted a way to make our bacteria signal if they saw a metabolite. Now you've probably done enough genetics now to know about promoters and that genes get switched on by particular compounds. And here's an example by with phenylalanine. This little promoter for the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene gets switched on by the phenylalanine and it makes, if we hook it up to light, in this case the Lux genes, we get light production. And th this is an example of our bacteria on a, on a Petri dish with no phenylalanine and then with phenylalanine. And with a light counting camera, we can see we get a huge production of light here uh, when it sees phenylalanine. And we could make basically these, using that mapping information, we could actually make these little fusions to all sorts of compounds. And there's a whole list of them. And they would light up on the roots of plants. And perhaps a better diagram is this. These are pea plants and little square petri dishes. This is our phenylalanine fusion, and these are our roots, and you can see it switching on at the tips of roots. Sucrose, not a lot happening, is there? Over here at 18 days, same pea plant. These are nodules. See the massive, the plant is flooding those nodules with sucrose because they're providing carbon to our nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And actually what they do is they take sucrose and they convert it to succinate and malate. And so you can see a massive signal now of succinate. So by starting out asking how could we find promoters which represent the presence of a particular compound, we could then link it up to light production. We could then go back to plants and ask where and when are you releasing that compound for our bacteria to see. So we could start building up these spatial and temporal maps, because look, at four days there's no sucrose, or very little, at 18 days there's a massive production. And you can see the same thing with, with a number of different compounds. Look, malinate is a compound made a lot by roots early on, but not as they age. And so we could start mapping a whole bunch of things. So, how, let's see again how that sort of ability to map things can be used. So let's look at adhesion. Vinoy in that microarray set found these three little genes. One, two, three. And what he found was they're very highly upregulated in the rhizosphere. The first gene, 118 fold upregulated relative to free living conditions. And we can upregulate them a little bit with phenylalanine in the lab, but the key thing is these are rhizosphere expressed genes. 
when you, make, when you actually knock out uh, two of those genes, you get a massive increase in the ability to stick to roots. This is just a pea uh, seedling and looking at how many bacteria are stuck onto the root. Um, and actually, so these things are affecting attachment. And I could go on and show you other, other uh, types of uh, images, but the key thing is they control attachment to roots. But this is one of the things that's really interesting. We actually take that little operon, take its promoter and say, when and where are you switched on? So this is the first gene, and this is an amazing uh, picture. Two days, seven days, 16 days of the same pea plant, and you'll notice it's switched on just at the root tips. We've, we can show with all sorts of data, which I don't want to confuse you with, that this is the master regulator of how bacteria recognise and first attach to roots. And it's only being expressed in the root elongation zone here. And if we zoom in on that, this is the same pictures but now just increasing the gain on the system. You can see exactly where we're being expressed. This is the same route but in high resolution image. And you can see this is where those genes are being switched on in a very, very specific area. I don't think it's, I, I'm giving away any story to say it. it looks like there's a specific plant glycoprotein made in that region which the bacteria is locking onto and is inducing this set of genes. But again, that's only become apparent through this high resolution mapping in time and space. And actually, it turns out if you think about it from your plant biology, this is where the root's growing, isn't it? You think about a plant growing in real soil, and people don't normally do that. They grow in sand or maybe in, in vermiculite under sterile conditions. But in soil, the root is just colonized with bacteria from and fungi and everything stuck all over the root. The only bit of root which is new and is up for grabs is this growing tip here. So clearly that's a region bacteria and fungi, well perhaps not fungi because they've got special ways of doing things, but bacteria really have to be able to recognise and lock onto. So it's a key region both in plant development and root development but also for plant microbe interactions. So this has been quite exciting stuff. And if you do, this is confocal imaging. This is where we make, uh, we label our bacteria constitutively with green to ask where are our bacteria. This is where we've made that a cherry fusion, red to that gene expression. And you'll notice there's a perfect overlay. This is in exactly that region that I showed you in the previous slide. This is this region I'm imaging here or Vinoy's imaging now in confocal. And the important thing is, look, it's right on the surface. It's not on the root hairs, it's right on the surface. So bacteria are attaching onto the surface of the root in that root elongation region. And that's probably separate pathway from sticking onto the root hair, the tip of the root hair, which is how you actually get a nodule form. That's the first stage in, in nodule formation. So, okay, a lot of transcriptional studies, you find genes that are upregulated. If you're lucky, you find an LPPE and you show that it's a master gene for how bacteria attach to roots. And if you're really lucky, you've got all these Lux, beautiful Lux mapping systems already worked out and you can start to tease apart how and where these genes are being expressed and how they're important. But one of the problems is, and this is a problem for bacterial genetics and, I, and for plant genetics as well, Transcription itself is very useful, but it doesn't necessarily tell you a gene's important. There's a lot of microbiologists, and I suspect plant biologists as well, have been broken on what's called reverse genetics. You get genes that go up in expression, then you rush in and you make mutants. And of course, with CRISPR becoming available, I'm sure there'll be plant biologists making lots and lots of mutants, and then finding they don't have a phenotype. Oh, I mean, that hurts. We've made hundreds of genes hundreds of mutations, I should say, on the basis of genes upregulated, I don't think we've ever had a single success of then getting a good phenotype. Hun uh, literally hundreds. Sometimes when we've made double mutants and triple mutants, yes, we have had clear phenotypes. It turns out that in, so, so we wanted to try and understand how you transition in these various stages of the life cycle of rhizobium, but we wanted to know what genes were important and we tried transcription, how else could we study it? And so there's a whole group of people here. There's Rachel up here, 
who with Vinoy developed a technique called insertion sequencing mutagenesis. And I'm, not, I'm going to give you some details of that, but very briefly, I'm not going to bore you with too many details. It's just a way of making random mutations in the entire genome, but then identifying using high throughput sequencing where the mutations are. You don't need to worry about the details. You could learn that in, a, in five seconds if you needed to. But the point is, you look at where the mutations are in your input pool and where the mutations are in your output pool. And your output pool is after you've grown on a plant. So if you're a mutation you need to grow on a plant, or sorry, I should say you're a gene you need to grow on a plant, and you mutate that, you get lost in the output pool. Yeah? Because you needed that gene to grow, if you mutate it in the input pool, then you go through the plant and you die, you get lost. And so if you do sequencing, the, gene, the, the, the mutant will be present in the input pool because it doesn't need that gene, but in the output pool, when it needed the gene, you get lost. And so the gene disappears, the mutation disappears out of the population. So, and then a whole bunch of people, Lili uh, with Vinoy did nodules, uh, Brandon's analysing a whole bunch of these types of mutants, and Haley is trying to develop a new uh, thing called BARSEQ. But what does that mean in, in effect? So what I was talking about here, you have an input pool, lo lots of, lots of colours, these are represent different mutants. Right? So these are all mutants. Every single, single bacterium has a mutation in a different position. So it's a population, and in our particular bacterium we have 7,357 genes, and we put them through a plant, through a rhizosphere, and then we recover the output pool. But look, this red one had a mutation, let's say in a gene it needed to stick to plant roots. You make a mutation in that gene, it doesn't, it, when you grow it in the lab, it grows fine, you put it through a plant selection, and of course it gets lost, because it's, it needs that gene to stick to roots, and so it gets lost, and then when we look at the output pool, it's not there. So here we have a high throughput sequencing technique that lets us work out where all the, muta where all the transposon mutations are. We have this mutant in this population and it gets lost there. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now it's incredibly powerful because it's a direct way of saying what genes do you need to stick to a plant root? What genes do you need to go through the human gut. What genes do you need and to grow on a particular carbon source? What genes do you need to fix nitrogen? And actually, through some fancy mathematics, which I can't understand for the life of me, you can apply a hidden Markov model, which is just a fancy way of saying you can classify all your genes. You can classify them as essential. You make a mutation in that gene, you are dead, completely dead. You're dis disadvantageous, you make a mutation in that gene, you have a large decrease in the number of uh, bacteria which can survive the environmental selection. Neutral doesn't matter. And the fourth category, actually, it's advantageous. Interestingly, there are lots of genes which if you mutate them, you'll grow better in a particular environment. Of course, you never get genes which are advantageous in multiple environments. I mean, if they were, that, mute, that gene would have been lost through selection over time. But there are, are genes which actually, when you mutate them, will grow better. So there are genes, for example, who get things which seem to promote growth in the rhizosphere. Right? You make a mutant in that gene, the bacteria grow faster and they grow better than the wild type. But of course, that mutant also grows worse than the wild type in other environments. So there's a selection to maintain a stability in the population. Okay. So now we've got our, our idea, we can start looking at different growth conditions. We can take a laboratory culture, we can put it in the rhizosphere and ask what genes cause the bacteria to get lost, what happens in root attached, infection thread, and nitrogen fixing symbiosis. Now there's one thing here to tell you about pain and hard work actually, I'll mention this. I told you that each nodule results from infection by a single bacterium. All right? Now this is a genomic population model. T to be representative, you've got to have 100,000, 200,000 bacteria. Each nodule is a single bacterium. If you want to get a population of 100 to 200,000, actually you end up picking 150,000 nodules. Right? That takes a year. That is horrible. 
I'm an evil human being to have subjected anyone to picking 150,000 nodules. But actually, the reason that someone did that was because the data that comes out of it is quite startling and quite um, unique. So sometimes you've got to do some hard work. And this is all I really want to say here. This is um, a, a quite um, amazing diagram, and I don't, I'm not going to drill down into the detail, but it, it is quite remarkable, because what it's allowed us to do is look at genes you need in the rhizosphere, and there are 55 genes, if you mutate them, our bacteria no longer grow in the rhizosphere. There are 176 genes which you need to grow in the rhizosphere as well, but if you mutate them, you don't attach to roots, you don't end up in nodule bacteria, and you don't end up as bacteroids. And there are only 55 which affect growth in the rhizosphere but don't seem to affect subsequent steps. There's 101 genes you need to attach to roots. Not to grow in the rhizosphere, but you don't need them at these subsequent steps. And there are only 14 genes that you need to attach to roots but also affect nodule bacteria and nodule bacteroids. Which is actually me saying earlier on, there's two pathways. There's a stick to roots pathway and there's a go through nodules pathway. And that's why there's only a small group of genes required all the way through. There's 80 genes you need just to be nodule, nodule bacteria. And by nodule bacteria, I mean the bacteria go into the nodule, they grow down that infection thread, and they start out as free-living bacteria still. They can still be regrown. If you squash the nodule, they'll regrow. But eventually they become the nitrogen-fixing bacteroids, and they are terminally differentiated. They no longer grow. So there are two populations of bacteria in a nodule. There are free-living bacteria and there are bacteroids. And you can see how we could subdivide things up into these different categories. And most of these genes, it turns out the nodule bacteroids, so there's 100, 180, 193 genes you need to be a bacteroid. 193 genes. In the literature, there are just over 20. Right? There are 20 genes you need to fix nitrogen. And now we're saying there's 193. Those 170 are not known until we did this work. Right? And the reason is they're genes you need to compete with other bacteria to get into the nodule. If you mutate them, most of them won't stop you fixing nitrogen if you put them onto a plant by themselves. But the moment they're in competition with other bacteria, they're toast. And so actually, that's it's actually... I got to a point where I thought, oh, there's no more questions for me. Oh, well, it probably isn't. I'm ready to retire almost, you know, within the next decade or so. And I thought, well, it's all answered. And that's telling me, no, it's not. We've only scratched the surface. There's all these questions about how different bacteria communicate with each other in communities and compete with each other in communities, which we have only just begun to look at. A whole host of things to try and understand. And just to take that a little bit further, you can come up with another technique called BarSeq, which is just the same technique that we've been using up to now with us making these saturation mutants, except now you put a barcode in each transposon. You go, oh, what the hell is he talking about now? All it means is you end up with a library. It's like I've got a population of, ah, okay, you're all bacteria for a day, okay? Don't be insulted, you're all bacteria. Now I'm going to lob a transposon into each one of you but it's going to go into a different position in each of you. Well, some of it's going to go in your foot, some of it's going to go in your head or whatever, and that represents a gene. But if we actually barcode those transposons, we do that by with the 20 mer A random 20 nucleotides gives you 10 to the 13 combinations. That's a big number. Yeah? And all we do is, is we, bar we, we mutate you, you've all got a unique barcode, we then just sequence the barcodes and so we know that, that, that malate dehydrogenase has this barcode in it. PEP carboxylase has this barcode in it. Um, pyruvate kinase has this code in it. Uh, RNA, uh, DNA polymerase 1 has another barcode in it. And we have that population of bacteria sitting in the freezer, so we can put them in any environment, and all we do is a single PCR reaction because it has little, uh, it has conserved sites on either end, and then we sequence, and we can see which barcodes get lost in any given environment. So it's in, suddenly it becomes unbelievably easy to take a population of marked bacteria. It's basically, we could take our mark, you could send you out now and see which per people get lost. Did you, did you find the ha-ha last night? 
Do you know what a ha-ha is? You must do, yeah? Yeah, some of you do, maybe some of you don't. So it's one of these things in great estates. I, I, I understand none of these things, being Australian. My wife has to tell me these things. You look out and you see this lovely vista. There's no wall. And if you keep walking, you fall down and break your ankles because there's a big ditch in front there. It's a ha-ha, so it doesn't block the view from a lovely estate. But it's like a wall. with a, It's a big ditch in front of... There's one out the front there. Go and have a look. Um, and actually, if you want to go and see the badger set, you have to climb down the ha-ha, which I was doing last night because I'm always breaking the rules and wandering out to see, because of the light on the oak trees further out was great. Um, but some of you might get lost by the ha-ha, and so your transposome would get lost. So it's just another way of being able to um, identify populations and what gets lost. So, okay, that lets us do lots of fancy genetics to try and understand what you need in a given environment. So. I'd like to just now talk very briefly about another student of mine, Marcella Mendoza, who wants to ask, how is it, if you have a population of bacteria, a green one and a red one, why is it that some bacteria get into nodules more than others and fix more nitrogen than others? So how do you measure that competition? And there's a nice thing. It turns out this is the NIFH gene which is one of the subunits of nitrogenase, which takes N2 and reduces it to ammonia. And when you make one of those light fusions to it, the light comes out of the nodule. And it comes out in proportion to how good a nitrogen fixing you are. If you fix a lot of nitrogen, you make a lot of NIFH, and you have a high expression. And so what Marcella did was made reporter plasmids, 96 of them, put a barcode in them again. Can you see the same themes coming up? When you get an idea, stick to it if it works. It's one of the principles of science. You know, if you have some good ideas and they work really well, see how you can apply them to other things. And so she makes labelled strains where each strain has a barcode, but it also has a NIFH Lux fusion, so it can see how much light it's producing. And she simply comes around afterwards. Look at that pea plant with all those beautiful glowing nodules. And she can now look for, in fact, when she puts, back, she puts plants into real soil, horrible real soil with an inoculum and 30% and of the nodules light up. <gasps> and then she pulls, back, pulls the nodules back out, takes the one which has the brightest uh, light and then she just looks at the barcode and she knows which strain it is. And she's just, she's just finished this thankfully for her PhD uh, which she's submitting in October and it turns out the ones that come back again are the ones which are the best field isolates. So it's working mm, perfectly. And the point is to make this a simple way for screening 96 strains or hundreds of strains simultaneously to get the best nitrogen fixing strains. And it works beautifully. So again, how that can be used. Another student, Annette uh, Westhook, who's just finished, used a similar thing to mark strains. Can you see the pink and, and red nodules? So we marked them with enzymes. And here she was just asking, do plants select good nitrogen fixing bacteria in that process. And she actually made a NIFH mutant and showed no, they can't select between the two. You know, she got, she got to, for example, her nitrogen fixers were, I um, can't remember which way around it was now, so if they're blue marked, the nitrogen fixers would still only come out at 50% of the nodules. She actually showed that the non-fixing strains are smaller, the nodules are smaller. The plant actually works out that there's not much nitrogen coming out of the nodule and it shuts it down. It's actually a very clever uh, process and there's some beautiful plant genetics in there for a bright person to work out um, in, in the future. And another student, Laura Clark, currently in the lab, wants to then say, but what happens if you get mixed nodules? Because although I said each nodule is a, is a clonal event, if you have a high population of bacteria, about 10% of them, actually are mixed. And she was asking, she's trying to ask, could that enable cheats to come through in the population? Yeah? And again, here what she's doing is she's uh, marking the two different types of bacteria, one that's a wild type, one that's got a NIFH mutation again, which must be a cheat, mixing them and then asking how many bacteroids are there versus bacteria. The bacteroids are bigger than the bacteria. 
so she can see in a, in a, a, a cyto flow cytometer which ones are there, and then obviously she can label them differentially with fluorescence. So she's basically asking what happens to the populations of bacteria in nodules and bacteroids in nodules, and can you get shifts in population? Can you get selection for cheetahs? Can they actually somehow increase their numbers in nodules? And then she's trying to model that mathematically, and I think, I think Martin, is it Martin Howard's coming tomorrow or the next day? Yep, yep, so, so I'm sure Martin will be talking an awful lot about modelling. Um, and, and finally on this sort of biochemical st uh, stuff is another student, Paul Rutten in the lab, is then trying to ask how does oxygen affect nitrogen fixation? Because nodules actually are red, they're red because they have leg haemoglobin in them. Basically it is the same structure as haemoglobin or myoglobin in your body except it's a completely different amino acid sequence, it's convergent evolution in plants. And what that haemoglobin does, that leg haemoglobin, is it maintains a low oxygen partial pressure but delivers oxygen to the bacteria because they're, they're aerobes. So you need to protect nitrogenase from oxygen um, because it's oxygen inactivated, it evolved in an anaerobic environment. Because after all, why is there so much oxygen in the air? You know the answer as plant, plant scientists. Here is the fact that, that plants actually have changed the whole geochemistry of the planet, along with bacteria, of course. So he's studying how that oxygen uh, uh, concentration gradient controls gene expression. Because in rhizobium, the genes are actually switched on. The NIF genes and the fixed genes, these are the genes you need to fix nitrogen, are actually induced by low oxygen tension. And he's trying to investigate the uh, genetic basis for that. Okay, so in the, in the last few minutes I'm going to switch tack completely and I'm going to talk about engineering nitrogen fixation into plants. Right? And this is actually work from um, Barney Geddes and, and Ponraj and then uh, uh, there's a, another series of postdocs actually who've just started who I should have put up, I've just realised but I haven't done. So in our lab one of the projects we're trying to do is to say how could we take microbes and get them to fix nitrogen in association with plants. And it runs in parallel to a series of projects, pure plant projects, to try and, for example, understand how to put nodules on cereals. Now, if you put a nodule on a cereal, that's wonderful, but nodules don't fix any nitrogen. It's the bacteria inside nodules, so you need to have both processes. And I started out uh, in our lab with a simple idea. If you want to have bacteria fixing nitrogen with a plant, you have to have a new control system. The plant has to make a signal to switch on genes in the bacteria, and the bacteria need to be able to recognise that signal. You, know, you have to have control. Biology is always about control. You can't just have bacteria fixing nitrogen randomly, or they'd be fixing nitrogen on weeds and all sorts of things, wouldn't they? You need to say, I want a wheat plant or a barley plant or a rice plant, which is going to have an associating bacterium and fix nitrogen. OK, the trouble is, that means we need to synthetically engineer a new pathway. So it gets into syn synbio, synthetic biology as well. But I had this idea that maybe we could take a molecule, I'm going to call it rhizopene, which we could engineer into plant roots, get them to secrete it. That's a heck of a, a, a demand, but oh well, you know, might as well try it. And that could then switch on nitrogen fixation and maybe even get the bacteria to produce a lipokytoligosaccharide like rhizobium does, some signal, either to switch on the rhizopene or the reverse way. And then to control, use this signal to control, control signal to then get the bacteria to secrete ammonia to the plant. Okay, so it turns out that this is, this is our wonderful legume here, this is a bean actually, uh, and the, what happens naturally is the bacteria inside root nodules get given carbon by the plant, don't they? And they secrete ammonia to it, so they take that into and they turn it into ammonia in response to carbon. Some rhizobia inside nodules actually make a molecule called scylloinosamine, they're called rhizopenes. So the bacteroids make these molecules, but they only make them in nodules, inside legume nodules. It's only a few rhizobia that do that. But it occurred to me that, that maybe that meant the precursors for rhizopene must be in the plant. And there are a few enzymes in the rhizobia which 
do the conversion. It turns out the ones that were published were all wrong, but at least it gave us the idea that we could do this. And we thought, ah, naively, we'll just take the genes out of the bacteria and put them into the plant and get the plant to make these rhizopenes. Okay, that was the idea. These were the genes that were published. They were all wrong, but it doesn't matter. Um, cutting out about three years' work and a lot of grief and pain. Uh, the other problem is, of course, these things are not... Um, you can't buy any of these compounds, you have to synthesise them and for fortunately we had a fabulous collaboration with chemists. Advice? If you're working anywhere in biochemistry or metabolism, find some, some great chemists to work with because they can do amazing things, really truly amazing things. Turns out this is the real pathway, we, just, we found all the genes, we you know, mutated them and so forth, we expressed all the proteins in the laboratory and we could see all these compounds being formed. We could do the chemistry and the chemist could do crystallography and uh, fabulous stuff. Um, turns out you can't express this in plants. There's no way. This is an enzyme complex which sits in the periplasm of bacteria and plant cells don't have periplasms. So that was the end of that. But we worked out that we could substitute an enzyme in here and make a synthetic molecule, this skiluinosamine here, by simply expressing two genes. We could do that in the lab and we felt great. What happens if we put them in plants? Uh, and so with our collaborators, uh, so this is uh, Ponraj, uh, is now at the Sainsbury lab working with Giles Oldroyd. So this is a collaboration between my lab and Giles Oldroyd, I should point out. And this is just showing when we express those two genes in, this is in uh, transgenic uh, hairy roots of met metacargo and truncatula. Indeed, we can detect the presence of this uh, skiloinosamine there. So we get this compound in the roots. But, okay, but we have to be able to detect it in our bacteria. But it turns out we have a lovely uh, sensor for this, the MOCR gene, which detects the presence of rhizopene. It's a regulator and then it switches. In this case, look, we're switching on LUX again. But we can switch on, it turns out, just about anything. And in our lab now, although I'm not going to show it, we can switch on NIFA we can switch on nitrogen fixation with rhizopene in the laboratory. We've done all these things now. We can switch on auxin synthesis in the laboratory. We can switch on phosphate solubilization genes in the laboratory. And I'm hopefully some of you are going, oh my goodness, what do I want? What do I want a bacterium to suddenly make around plant roots? Anything you want, it becomes a potential for us to switch on using this MOCR gene, it's, it's the regulator, when it sees rhizopene. And that's just showing you boring, that's just showing you the response curves. And those response curves are much better now because we've, we've improved the uh, biosensor. But here is a crunch slide. This is uh, Medicargo truncatula. This is with a control. This is our engineered plants. And this in particular is barley. The key thing I want you to notice here is this is our Lux fusion in our bacteria, right, with that mock R in the rhizosphere. And these are plants engineered to make rhizopene, and our bacteria are lighting up in the rhizosphere. In other words, the plants are making rhizopene, and they're secreting it into the rhizosphere. And we are able to get really, really nice expression here. So we have a system now where the plants are making a completely novel signal, where our bacteria can detect that signal at levels. And we've now done this in soil, and it actually works in soil as well. There's enough rhizopene coming out for our bacteria to switch on LUX production. And LUX, of course, again, you can see the signal type logic coming through again and again and again. This enables us to look at this spatially and temporally. Of course, the next step is to say, what molecule do you want to make? And bacteria can make just about anything. Um, and as I said, we can actually, we can now switch on nitrogen fixation, actually measure nitrogen fixation, auxin production and so on. So that's how... Um, that's at the stage of, well, that's the stage of trying to publish it. The trouble is, with work like this, the, the editors start saying things, well, this is great, yeah, you can publish this, just show us, just show us it in the field, um, in wheat plants or barley plants. Uh, and so you, you, uh, 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 you, you feel like, at that point, crying after having spent so many years um, doing it. But, but obviously, um, some journals set very high standards, as they should. I'm going to stop there, but um, I, I've got a final acknowledgement slide, and I, and I think this is my most important slide. Yeah? Uh, one, I, I'm acknowledging the funders down here, normally much smaller, normally much bigger than that. 
Um, but, but this is um, different uh, members of the lab at different times. Um, the key thing here is have fun. Yeah? That's my, my guiding principle in doing science. Uh, it can be a lonely, long uh, process at times, but it has lots of highs as well. Um, so, you know, uh, in the great weather, uh, go swimming in the Thames or whatever. Go, go have a great time. And it's going to be a lot about the people you work with and interact with. Um, that's going to make the difference between what could be a lonely existence or an existence where you find someone who's really clever and they'll help you. Because my career has been about being a few bricks short of a load, but it hasn't mattered because I've always been able to get on with people and get people to help me, get clever people. You know, if I'm motivated and have an interesting biological problem, and that's what I would say, identify a really important biological problem and then get to know clever people and, they, and they'll help you, they really will. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's a great advantage. Um, Jane is looking at me up there as, as a former head of department of plant sciences with a sort of, oh, my dear, this is... Uh, anyway, but I think that's a really important thing. It's about uh, the social aspect of science is important um, and, and it really does help you get on. And at that point, I will be quiet. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>